So, um, in, today I want to talk about Zen ancestors, in particular three Zen ancestors. Um, but I also want to—I also want to just mention before we start. Um, As you all know, there's a, been a terrible tragedy in, in Maui. And I think all of our hearts go out to everyone there. Um, and it's a reminder of how vulnerable we all are and how much we, um, how important it is for us to care for one another. So um, please do that. So every week we chant the names of the Soto Zen ancestors. Not, not all that have passed the tradition down to us, uh, but the ones that we have um, remembered, noted, recorded. Uh, we know that there are many, many more that go unnamed for a variety of reasons. Uh, but their teachings are alive in our lives and our practice, even if their names have not been remembered. So uh, naming those that are unnamed is important. So that's, that's why I start off by naming those that are unnamed. Um, so we recall, uh, we call, we recall them and express our gratitude towards them and their teachings. Uh, what has been passed down to us in this Zen tradition is a, a whole rich, wonderful variety of expressions of the teachings, people, stories, sayings, challenges, encouragement, contradictions, lots of contradictions. Um, so encountering um, this recounting of a lived experience of people, it's like dipping into a, a deep stream. So there's vastly more than we can fit into our little ladle, but we, we do it and we taste it. Uh, Nelson Foster, wonderful uh, Zen teacher and writer, calls this the roaring stream, the roaring stream of our ancestors. And recently I was, um, I was looking for something and I picked up uh, Nelson's book again. And um, it's called The Roaring Stream. So here it is if you haven't seen it before, um, it's a treasure. So if those of you who are interested, um, I encourage you to read it, at least just dip into it. It's just short chapters with a, uh, like a biography or writing about who different Zen ancestors were, Rinzai and Soto, um, and Indian. Um, and anyway, I think it starts with Indian, maybe China. Uh, yeah, starts with China. 
anyway, um, it's quite it's quite a wonderful treasure trove. So, if and when you do, um, you'll find a wide diversity of voices, perspectives, practice guidance, and firmly held positions regarding the Dharma. And as I said, there's lots of contradictions. Um, some teachers advocate uh, years and years of rigorous, even extreme physical discipline and zazen in a monastic setting. And others propose a view of deep practice that is fully compatible with ordinary life. Some tell stories of lifelong pilgrimage, of being settled monastics, um, some in solitude, and some selling tea. So as with any exploration of Zen teaching, the key is to hear them all, to be open to being challenged in what you think, what you think the way of Zen is. And at the same time, take up what calls to you as the most life-giving, deepest way. So we say this over and over again, but deep practice does not have any fixed form. Only that whatever the form, it goes to your core and transforms you. So I thought I'd draw today um, from On the Roaring Stream and talk about these three Zen ancestors, Muso, Basui, and Banke. All three of them are primarily in the Rinzai tradition, and they all bring a sense of openness along with a spirited, dedicated practice. Each of them has a unique perspective and teaching, but I think we will hear that, at least to my mind, they have a shared spirit or taste. So I'm, I want to be clear that I'm not commenting on their teachings um, in terms of formal koan study. That's for someone else to do. Um, that's for someone in the Rinzai tradition to do. But that doesn't mean that these teachings are off limits to us. We can investigate them deeply in our own path. So the, the first Zen master that I'm gonna talk about is Zen master Muso. And he lived from 1275 to 1351. He was born in wealth and somehow managed to be both completely dedicated to his Zen practice, most often living in a hermitage, and at the same time provide, provide counsel to the political elite. And this was at a time of great change. So think about it, that's a very tricky proposition, but he did it. His, his words, some of, the, some of his words set the tone for our encounter with these teachings. So I'd like to read them to you. Foods have many flavors, which one could be defined as which one could be defined as quintessential. As people's constitutions differ, so do their tastes. Some people like sweet, some like peppery foods. If you said the flavor you like is the quintessential flavor and the rest are useless, you would be an imbecile. So it is with Buddhist teachings. Because people's natural inclinations differ, it may be 
a particular teaching is especially valuable to a given individual. But it becomes false if one clings to it as the unique and only truth to the exclusion of all other teachings. Okay, so this was said sometime between 1275 and 1351. And this is the essence of the way we follow a path with a good heart and, and an open view. So he advocated a way of practice that could be done anywhere. And um, I wanna read you some more of his words and these words might sound familiar to you uh, for those of you that have been hanging around here for a while listening to our teachings. Okay. People meditating on the fundamental carry out their ordinary tasks and activities in the midst of meditation and carry out meditation in the midst of ordinary tasks and activities. There is no disparity between meditation and activity. People who really have their minds on the way in con do not forget work on the fundamental, no matter what they are doing. An ancient master said, the mountains and rivers, the whole earth, the entire array of phenomena are all one cell. If you can absorb the essence of this message, there are no activities outside of meditation. You dress in meditation, you eat in meditation, you walk, sit, stand, and lie down in meditation. You perceive and cognize in meditation. You experience joy, anger, sadness, and happiness in meditation. This is a really generous view, but it's also a demanding one, right? For we have to ask, what is the practice that can be done 24 hours a day? What does it mean for me in my life? It's possible to take on this instruction and have it be very vague and simply wander around. If we do not ground ourselves in a clear direction. So we ask, what is this fundamental matter to me, to you? What is this fundamental matter? It's a creative process. Asking, responding, caring, attending, living. In this, we're quite content to be ordinary. Quite ordinary. We do this together in a simple way. We sit, we chant, we bow, we care for one another, and we care for our world. He was a, a great poet, was so. And he wrote this poem that I like a lot. So I'd like to read it to you. It's called From the Beginning. From the beginning, the crooked tree was no good for a lordly dwelling. How could anyone expect the nobles to use it for their gates? Now it's been thrown out onto the shore of this harbor village handy for fishermen to sit on while they're fishing. <laughs> this, to me, this poem speaks of our humanity. From the beginning, a crooked tree. We're not perfect. We don't need to be. We do not need to aspire to greatness or renown. In fact, we're more than any of that. The next line tells us of the freedom that comes when we allow ourselves to simply be a part of the world. No self to cling to. Now it is thrown out onto the shore of the harbor village, handy for fishermen to sit on while, while they're fishing. Simple, just there, just being of use to ordinary human beings. It's a homely image, 
Yeah. Yeah. Providing ease to hardworking people. This is the life of a bodhisattva. It's a voice of inclusion, of steadiness, liberation in this life, this ordinary human life. But the requirement is that we recall the fundamental matter in all of our activities. Baswi, the second master I want to talk about, lived from 1327 to 1387. And he lived in a world that was very different from Musa's in a way. He lived on the margins of the Zen world. He didn't train at any of the major monasteries. He was not connected to the elite in society. He sought out opportunities to study and to practice wherever he could. He became deeply steeped in the uh, teachings and practice and study of this way, the Zen way. And he developed his own unique way of expressing it. This is what he asked his students to do, to single-mindedly ask, who is the master of hearing this sound? Who is the master of hearing this sound? So a focus on hearing has a long tradition in Buddhism. <laughs> So in many ways, this is not new, but the simplicity and depth and single-mindedness of this in many ways is unique to Baswi. He was fiercely dedicated to just this, to this way of practice. And also the fact that it was open to everyone, anyone, anytime, anywhere. It sounds simple. But to bear fruit, it requires us to be caught by this question, to have it alive in our life. And a spirit of earnestness, discipline, and energy. So it's a, such a simple thing. But to stop, who is hearing? <laughs> who is hearing? He says, do you wish to penetrate, to penetrate directly and freely? Do you wish to, to penetrate directly and be free? When I am talking like this, many people are listening. Quickly. Look at the one who is listening to this talk. Who is he, she, they? Who is she, he, they that is listening right now? Right now. Right now. Do you wish? Do you wish to penetrate directly and be free? Is that something that you want? Is that something that you care about? When I am talking, many people are listening. Quickly, look into the one who is listening to this talk. Who is listening right now? So this was his primary, primary teaching. Totally portable, right? Just like Musa's, totally portable. Totally unfathomable and engaging. So then a questioner, because he did a lot of question and answer, a questioner said, all right, Baswi, Master Baswi. If this practice is the essence of all the Buddhist teachings, 
does that not make the practice of precepts meaningless? If this practice is the essence of all Buddha's teachings, does that not make the practice of precepts meaningless? Well, what, what about our ethical behavior? Is this what we're supposed to do is just do this and we can just walk around and do whatever we feel like with people? <laughs> So what he does is he goes through each precepts and points out how breaking them arises from what he says, when a person sinks in the sea of passion and discrimination, killing their own Buddha mind. So the key then, according to Master Basui's teachings, is to stay awake to our responsibility to others in two ways by not causing harm and by practicing in such a way that our minds and hearts are transformed so that we no longer sink in the sea of passions and discriminations or not led around by our delusions. When we do that, we kill our own good of mind. And then he says, if we do this, we will attain the Buddha way as surely as water combines with water. No, no separation. Finally, I want to talk about Zen Master Banke, who lived uh, considerably later. Hmm. I got, his, I got his name. Oh, yeah. 1622 to 1693. I had him list, uh, living from 1622 to 1593, which doesn't really work. <laughs> 1622 to 1693. So he presented another radically simplified form of practice. And then he just really got to the root. And he said, just stop and look back to the origin of this self of yours. Just stop and look back to the origin of this self of yours. This is what he referred to as the unborn. And he proposed that there is no need for long painstaking practice, perhaps because he had done it to the extreme. So this is how the story goes. At age 25, this fiercely dedicated son of a samurai sealed himself in a cave and sat until his butt was raw from ceaseless sazen, and he was quite ill. So there he is in a cave, his butt is raw, he's pushed himself to the limit and he starts coughing up blood. In that state, his understanding shifted radically. And he saw such austerities as needless. That everyone is endowed with he call, what he calls the unborn Buddha mind of illuminated wisdom. The unborn Buddha mind of illuminated wisdom. And then he completely changed what he was doing and he dedicated himself to teaching this to as many people as he possibly could. He spoke of the activity of Buddha's, of the Buddha's mind, illuminative, illuminative wisdom, in a way that may sound very familiar, again, to you who recall our many references to driving and walking and being with others as a natural expression of realization. So let me read to you what he said. Okay, while you're walking down a road, if you happen to encounter a crowd of people approaching from the opposite direction, none of you gives a thought to avoiding the others, yet you don't run into one another. You, you aren't pushed down or walked over. 
You thread your way through them by weaving this way and that, dodging and passing on, making no conscious decisions in this, yet you're able to continue along unhampered just the same. Now in the same way, the marvelous illumination of the unborn Buddha mind deals perfectly with every possible situation. Okay? So there's this naturalness he's talking about, this natural expression. So this way of understanding practice is deeply inviting. And it also requires us to stay awake to our lives and to the foundation of our being. Otherwise we go to sleep. So we can just say, oh, well, you know, it's all here, it's just fine. We can just bumble along doing what we do, you know. Then we're not realizing or enacting the practice. It's not alive and it's not transforming suffering. It's simply sidestepping it. We're fooling ourselves when we do that. So there's real discipline required to allow this practice to take root and flourish. This understanding of our fundamental nature means that there's no possible way to construct hier hierarchies of who is and who is not capable of realization. Realization cannot be bound by such ideas. That this is equal for all, I think is obvious if you think about it. Banke points this out in terms of men and women but does not limit his point of view to gendered ideas. So let me, let me read you something about equality. <laughs> He's been talking for a while about this. It says, and while we're on the subject of women's Buddha minds, I know there are many women who are deeply troubled by the people who say they are cut off from Buddhahood just because they're women. This is a thread in Buddhism, right? Nothing could be farther from the truth. I'm addressing the women here now, so listen carefully. But I want you to think about this as anything that you think about yourself, any definition that you have or that other people have for you that says, oh, you, you, you're not, you're not able, you're not included. So I'm addressing the women here, the people here, here and now, so listen carefully. How could women be any different from men in this? Men are Buddha beings, women are Buddha beings. You needn't doubt it for a moment. Once you've got the principle of the unborn fixed in your mind, you're unborn whether you are a man or woman. Here's something that will prove to you that the Buddha mind is the same in men and women, the same in all people. There are a lot of people gathered here. Now suppose that outside the temple walls, someone started to beat on a drum and strike a bell. When you heard these sounds, would the women mistake the drum beat for the bell or the bell for the drum beat? No. As far as hearing these sounds is concerned, no difference exists between men and women. It's not only true of men and women, there are people of all kinds in this hall, old people and young, priests and laity and so on. But there wouldn't be any difference in the way that a young person or a monk or a lay person heard the sounds either. The place in which there is no difference in the hearing of these sounds is the unborn, the Buddha mind and it's perfectly equal and absolutely the same in each one of you. This is a radical statement. Think of all the ways that we construct hierarchies. Think of all the ways that we divvy up humans. What we're hearing over and over again is that that doesn't work. So, it's interesting um, that sometimes people would point out to Banke, well, wait a minute. You, you busted your butt, literally. 
So your understanding was born of this fierce determination. So it can't be true for me. And he never wavered, never wavered. He kept coming back to this simplicity and this radical point. I, I really like these guys. I really like them, along with many other precious stories in here. They tell us something. But each of these tells us asks us to remember who we are fundamentally, to enact it in our lives with dedication and groundedness, fully capable of deep practice, no matter our circumstances. I think this is very encouraging and it also poses a challenge Because if this is true, we cannot decide that our ordinary lives are somehow outside the realm of deep practice. Musso tells us that when we really have our minds on the way, really have our minds on the way, dressing, eating, walking, and I would add cooking, driving, cleaning, the house, going to work are all included. Baswi guides us, asks us to practice earnestly to turn to the question, who hears? To keep this close. And Banke clears the deck, kind of, all together, and tells us straight out that Buddha mind's illuminative wisdom is operative and expressed through us every day. Each of them points to the fact that when we face our lives as they are, take them up as real and valuable and full of Dharma gates. There is no getting around it. Deep practice and the Buddha's mind are right here. But the kicker here is we have to face our lives. We have to listen. We have to step into our lives in a certain way and make this real. And then let it go. And just ordinary. So we ask, how do I, how do I realize and enact that? Thank you. <laughs>